not that busy, you can still get a lot of attention to the customers. Is that true? But if you're going to do any kind of a volume, you better have good systems or you'll start dropping people into grease. Is that true? Yep. Every business that does any kind of volume does it around systems. The point of that is simply saying this. When you hire people, what do you hire them to do? Use your tools to run your system. They don't do it their way, they do it my way. On our team, or in KW, uh, we try and encourage the agents to develop a system approach to get better customer service and use tools to make it more easy and more profitable to have the systems that you have. Ultimately, people are the ones uh, that will drive it. These are a look at the core systems and subsystems of an agent's business. There's only three. I don't care who you are, where you are, you have three core systems. The seller system, the buyer system, and the lead generation system. Again, below those are some of the subsystems. If we have a continued shifting market, you will have need for a distressed seller system within your overall seller system. Um, I work with builders. We have a separate builder seller system. The way we work with builders is not like we work with a regular owner occupant. But the overall picture is still the same, whether it's a builder or a, or a distressed seller or a regular owner occupant. Do we need to put it in the MLS? Yes or no? Yeah. Do we need to have sign up? Yeah. Do we need to have a lockbox? It's new construction and finish. Need a lockbox. Do you need to market the property? Yeah. Do you want to have it on Facebook? Uh, are you going to get offers? Yeah. Do you want to get a contract? You've got to take a contract closing. You understand they're all. The bulk of what we do is the same for all these people, but there are different steps depending on the special nature of the client. Uh, in addition, these are the three core systems of your business. There are two other systems, though. All agents have the financial system, your budget, your, your money, um, and then if you're building a team, you would have the recruiting system. So there would be five if you have a team, four if you are an agent. Uh, the tools look like this. Collateral materials. Collateral materials are what separate the pros from uh, people that aren't professional. And it literally boils down to your stuff. Can you show me your stuff? Do you have every year, do you give to your entire med database your 2020 guide to buying homes? Where should I say? Mawa? Is that how you say it? Mawa. Mawa? I can't say it. I'm from the South. That don't work for the South. Mawa? <laughs> I said, Mama. <laughs> that's, that's the only reason I'm good at it. So you should send out the 2020 guides in January of uh, buying homes in Mawa, the 2020 guide to selling homes in Mawa, the 2020 guide to investing in real estate, the 2020 guide to second home ownership. You should be sending out collateral material. What does that material do? It demonstrates how much you know, and it, and it does it way better than you running your mouth at a cocktail party. Is that true? You can't demonstrate knowledge and expertise with your mouth like you can with collateral material or with websites or with a variety of tools, lists, guides, all kinds of stuff. The KW books, MREI, the Millionaire Real Estate Investor book, the Flip book, the Whole book, the One Thing book, the Your uh, First Home book, the Green in Your Home book. We have so many tools that are called collateral material in this company and you're not using them. And I'm saying that because we know how many books are being ordered. Everybody you sell a home to, everybody, 90 days after the closing, if they have small kids, they should get a copy of the Millionaire Real Estate Investor book. And on the inside, it should say, this book can buy your kids college 20 cents on the dollar. Please read through, note the 15 pages I've tabbed over, and then let's meet and talk about how you can buy your kids college 18 years from today for 20 cents on the dollar, period. Everybody, if we all did that as, a, as an industry, unpaid college debt wouldn't be nearly as big as it is. You believe that to be true? That's absolutely true, it's absolutely true. So you need to use this collateral material. By the way, command will allow you to do what um, was discussed at the break. You'll be able to go online, click, order the book, Click, write the note inscription. It'll be put in the book, mailed for you. Just click, click, click. Command will drive that. Uh, obviously, the technology, uh, the database, that is command, 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 and all the related tools with command. 
uh, Mega Camp uh, Reunion, uh, the Market Center. Are things changing? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, things are changing. At minimum, all of you need to be in the Market Center taking whatever command or other KW technology training is going on because you are resistant to change and you don't like technology. And the only cure is shove your fanny into a chair in a training program. You just have to take take the time to go and be sure you attend. If you don't, what's going to happen? The agent who does adopt is going to take your business from you on the internet. They're not doing it deliberately, but it's going to happen. And you're not going to get it back. So, and then people. We've talked about you know, this a little bit. Virtual assistance, part-time help is good. When you look at the business, the red book says the business is broken down into two halves, sales and admin. Is this true? Those of you familiar with the org chart in the seventh level, right? Is that it? That's it. And it says the agent, and I'm going to use R for Rainmaker, the agent is on both sides at level one, right? They do everything. And the book literally says graphically to you that half the work is admin and half is sales. And as, as you go down that ladder, it shows you every time you had somebody here, you had somebody here. Is that true? Yep, yep, there's a harmony between admin and sales. Uh, I'm not gonna draw it the way the red book draws it, but I'm drawing the same thing. It says the first hire is admin one, the second hire is admin two, and the third hire is the buyer agent. You all have heard Gary say all the time that the way to build a really powerful big business is to build a really powerful small business. When he says that, he's talking about this. The agent and three people. Two admin and one agent. And the reason this is the one to focus on is because without the admin, you don't have a powerful business. If you're on vacation, nothing happens in your business. When you hire admin, something happens, but if you're on vacation, there's nobody to show property or take a listing. Is that true? So once you hire that person, you now have the business running properly every day of the week, right? And that is a powerful small business. This unit, the agent, not you, because at 500,000, you could afford the admin before, but in the nation, 36 sales would be the probable number an agent needs to be at to have the hire in the budget this person will plus 24 units capacity to the business, and that is 60 a year. So that first LID calculation we did, a single agent, they would make one admin hired that could do that uh, 60 deals a year. That unit is a really powerful business unit. A really powerful business unit. That'd be 600,000 GCI with one hire. Is that powerful? Yep. Oh my God. How many small business owners are there in your community who would love to make 600 grand a year with one hire? And it ain't happening, is that right? That it, ain't, it just ain't happening. Yeah, yeah, the low overhead, and the, the big overhead would be that higher and everything else is peanuts. So um, the Red Book, I wouldn't say it misleads, but it mischaracterizes what this person is. In the Red Book, it calls this person first assistant. The Red Book also says somewhere else your three key hires from Ned and Million, lead admin, lead buyer agent, lead listing agent. Is that correct? Okay. I'm going to tell you right now, lead admin is not synonymous with first assistant. So there are a lot of agents that I've seen do this. They'll make this first admin hire and they, they pay the pay and make the hire for an assistant, but what they want is the lead admin. Does that make sense? So their business stalls because they think they got a lead admin, but they didn't, they got an assistant. An assistant is like a VA or part-time. They bring stability to the business, but they don't bring growth. If you want growth, you need somebody that will bring stability and growth. And that is what talented people do. And they're not gonna be paid like a first assistant, and you won't treat them like an assistant. They're a professional that has a job description and they do what they're supposed to do at a high level. Is that true? That's different than an assistant. An assistant, you throw at them whatever you want them to do, including pick up your dry cleaning. You do that with the lead admin person, they'll quit. 
they'll tell you that's not my job. Is that true? It's not, not the same mindset. So a lot of agents will make that hire and it works out because this person's job is to take over the systems, which are the seller, the buyer, the lead gen, they take over building and running the database. They'll be the listing manager. They'll be the closing coordinator. They'll build and set up the budget. They'll do client care. Does it sound like a lot? Yep. Yeah. That's everything this person's supposed to be doing while they're selling 36 deals. So what's the nature of all this stuff when they hire that person? It's a stinking mess. This, this, this is a mess. So agents often say to me, well, I'm so busy, I don't know when I found the time to train this person. Uh, you don't understand. What are you gonna train them how to build a mess? Because you don't know what you're doing. You hire the systems person who comes in and builds all these out. That is exactly what you hire them to do. You don't train them, they train you. I'm not kidding, they will train you to do things differently so that you are now working inside a system, right? So when you uh, look at the red book, it says the next hire is another admin. Well, a lot of agents that get this right will go, this is working out so good, I just need to get the buyers off my plate so they go hire a buyer agent. Is that true? Happens all the time. Now, I understand that this person will plus 24 units to the business potential, which will be 84 a year. This person will plus 36 units, add to the 84, that's 120 a year. So if you hire that person and then go there, 60 plus 36 is 96. These two people can manage that. What's happening to that person? They're drowning. That's too much work for one person. 96 deals, too much admin work. So what happens to customer service? It goes down. What happens to this person's career worth having? It goes down. This person, if that person is drowning, what happens to the support for this person? Not good. This person is telling this one, look, if you want this to close, you gotta do the paperwork yourself. I'm too busy, right? And this person's thinking what? I'm giving you 60% of my money and I'm still doing everything I did as, as a single agent. Why am I here? This is stupid. Yes or no? And this one is calling this one and saying, you know what, I, I gotta get caught up so I'm not answering the phone until noon today. Customer service has officially died in your business. Our active buyers and sellers can call and talk to us and we're not gonna talk to them. Is that true? So what happens? That one and that one quit and start their own team because that one's an idiot. I'm not kidding, have you seen this happen? Happens all the time, happens all the time. Talent will not suffer Idiots. Yes. How do you keep them? Long time. Uh, well, I've had over 200 people on the team, which means a bunch of them did not stay for a long time. <laughs> but Debbie York, who is our lead team administrator, she's 16 years with us. She's brilliant, powerful, talented. Um, I have agents. Cindy's been with us nine years now. Um, we have one new person on the team right now, and we have two new admin people, but the ones that are two new on the admin, the others, one took another opportunity for more money, and I will not overpay, and uh, I will pay high, but I won't overpay. And uh, the other one just retired out. So the issue is you provide a career worth having. That's the short answer. You provide a career worth having, and an agent on the business should have a career worth having as well. And a career worth having is making more money than they were making before they joined the team. I don't have an agent on my team who doesn't have a six-figure income net. And they have a very specific job description. They only do five things and they don't do anything else. So anyway, so here's the point. You should plan on 90 days to find and hire that person. The Red Book does not say this at all, but the only reason you hired that one is if you intend to hire that one. So you either hire that and stay there or you'd be prepared to hire both of these people. You follow me? Okay, so when you hire that one, this one will be in a 30, 60, 90 day prove out, but while they're in the prove out, you could be hunting that one. Yes? You all follow me? So the day I say that one's a keeper, I hire that one. And then that one's in their 90 day prove out, 30, 60, 90, and I could be hunting that one. So the day I say that's a keeper, I hire that one. So I can build this thing in 270 days. Following the model and being very, very prudent and making sure you're not making a bad mistake. 
So in one year, you could build this, and the following 12 months, you'd pop a minimum of 100 to 120 deals. The rainmaker would do 70 closed sellers. The buyer agent would do 50. The minimum would be 60 and 40. So that would be 100 to 120 deals a year. It's your 10,000 bucks a pop. That would obviously get you to what? Gross $1 million plus. And that is the big goal thrown down in the red book is get to gross a million and then get to net a million. The people who get to gross a million and hold it in one to two years can get to net a million. It, it moves faster. When you build this, it gets faster. <laughs> faster. Now, if you really want to be prudent, if you're a single agent in the room and you knew you wanted this, you could start out and you'd have 90 days to find that one. You'd have 180 days to find that one. And you'd have 270 days to find that one. Is that plenty of time to find everybody? Yes. Yes. It would take set time every week to be hunting, but only a small amount as opposed to a lot of time if you've only got 90 days. Does that make sense? Yes. James, what's a typical comp plan for uh, an Salary plus bonus. Uh, if you look at most markets, if they're, if they're, as Gary calls it, if they're empire builders, if you're truly hiring the right high level talent, they're going to cost you about the same as a legal secretary in most markets. So in my market, a legal secretary makes $45,000, $50,000 a year. The really good ones will make $60,000 a year. But most agents are hiring admin in my market between 35 and 42. And I'm paying at least five grand more than that for a lead admin. No, that's a, that, she asked about a license. That is a state law issue. That is not a, you need to have a license. No, they don't. Uh, I have admin on my team who do not have licenses and I have admin who've had licenses. It's not the issue in my state. It is in some states. Some states, they all have to have a license. So that is a state law issue, right? Any other questions about this? This is not for everybody, but for the people who want to build a powerful business that can get you to gross a million, which should point you to net a million, this is it. Th build this right first in order to get to the net. Uh, okay, so let's move on here. So how are you doing your business? This is the question you gotta look at. If your commitment is to be the same as everybody else, that's a commitment to the 80%, the pay grade for the 80% is 40 to $60,000 a year. If you want to be better than everyone else and be in the 20%, that is a commitment to a six-figure income, and that is a commitment to systems, tools, and maybe people at a at a level, at a level. And there's more than the 80 percenters are, but you have. What makes a true system a system? Yes. It's proven to work. Yes, and yes, but there's something else that makes it a system. Every agent has a system. Yes, but every agent does that. Now, there's one simple thing. It's written. It's written. If you tell me you got systems, I'll believe you. But is it a true system? It's written. Why? That's it. So they can be tracked. So they can be checked off. Did we do everything we were supposed to do with Mr. Johnson? You know? I mean, we're running 20 closings a month on the Rivers team. If we don't check off everything, somebody's going to get dropped into grease. And I'm not in the grease dropping business. No, I'm, I'm very serious about that. I'm not making a joke. How do you think you get the 70% referral based? You don't ever drop people in the grease. And if you ever did, you scream and holler and pound and fire somebody or change the system. But you can't stand it when somebody gets dropped in the grease. Right? Yes or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, and you make up for it however you can make up for it. If you drop somebody in the grease, fix it. Make up for it. Make up for it. And I mean it. Go overboard to make up for it. Yes, sir. So for our task list, we have it written down. We're tracking it now. Sell it to cover some. Is there a task going in itself right here using like 20 pages a month? Command. Yeah. Command. Okay. Command is going to solve all your problems. And I don't mean it will be problem free, but it will solve all your problems. There is no single foolproof piece of technology that's ever been invented. None has ever been foolproof. Is that true? So it's going to be a work in progress, and Gary makes that statement repeatedly. It will never be finished. It will always be being worked on, but it will be the best solution that you've ever had. And it will be fully integrated, which is awesome. 
and you all know that we're getting ready to dock Luke. You're going to have DocuSign. So, I mean, it's just going to be a paperless, powerful system, access available to all the parties to the transaction. It'll be just sweet, sweet, sweet. Okay, um, now the last category is people who do the business unlike everybody else. Now, you need to think about that. You, you do not win by being looked at as a commodity. If a, if a seller ever says to you, well, we don't want to pay six, we're going to pay five, and we're not here to set commissions, I'm using an example. What you should hear that seller saying is, you look to me like all other realtors, and we're just looking for the one that'll say the cheapest price, and that's who we're going to hire. Your mindset should be to build your business to the point where people actually want to hire you. And when it comes to the commission, and they say, well, we like to talk about your commission. I always say, this, these are all scripts, I always say, awesome, I love talking about my commission. It runs from six to 10%. I'm feeling good about seven, how about y'all? Whoa, 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 whoa. No, we were thinking something like 5%. No, I don't do 5%, six to 10%, and I'm feeling good about seven, what do you say? No, can't we? no, we thought it was negotiable. It is, six to 10, you wanna go eight? I like eight, eight is really good. Really good. No, get serious, Mr. Rivers. Well, I am being serious, but I'll tell you what I'll do. You want five, I want seven, we'll settle on six, shake. Now that happens nine times out of 10. That's just the way it goes, because I know they want to hire me. Y'all follow that? No, we're absolutely not gonna hire anybody unless it's 5%. Well, I never should have put this appointment in. I'm sorry, Mr. Johnson. I wish you the best of luck. I'm leaving. And about half the time, I'll get to the door and I'll say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We didn't know you felt that strongly about it. It's only the money for my family, Mr. Johnson. How do you think I'm gonna feel about it? One of those dollars that I get, and I get three dollars. One of those goes to my brokerage, one of those goes to get your home sold, one goes to my family. Which one do you think I'm gonna give up? None, that's the right answer, Mr. Johnson, none. Okay, so when you become more of a commodity, you get more commission activity. When you create some uniqueness to your business, you become more indispensable. And when you have a lot of uniqueness, you are highly indispensable. The value proposition you have can start with you simply not doing things like everybody else. So you gotta think about that. If you call us, yeah, I need to sell my house, I got your name from Bob at work. We're gonna ask a, a series of questions. Wonderful, hold on a minute, I need to ask you some questions. We're gonna, we're gonna collect data. That's the first thing you do in a seller or a buyer system. At first contact, you collect data, specific data a list of eight questions that all will go right into the CRM. So most of those calls come into the office. So the person says, wait a minute, I need to ask you some questions. They're pulling up a form online that they're gonna fill out because that's gonna self enter right into the CRM. Does that make sense? Okay. That will create a prompt for, this is a seller member, that will create a prompt for a virtual assistant that we have full time 40 hours a week who's in the Philippines and he's the listing assistant. And the prompt will be a pre-listing package is gonna to go to that person via email, via snail mail, or via courier or delivery. And that phone call is gonna drive that conversation. So the listing agent will get that data. The listing agent will click on what they want to happen with the listing package. Every seller we have, I want I want that package to be delivered, delivered to them at work within 30 minutes of the phone call. If it's a dual income family, remember that data, it's do you have a spouse and where do they work? I wanna deliver the package to the spouse too at their office within 30 minutes of the phone call. The package is a big package, it's a manila envelope, it has the pre-listing package and the questionnaires and the forms we need filled out prior to the appointment. They have to fill out forms prior to the appointment. Fill out forms. You wanna qualify people, ask them to fill out forms. The A's will fill out forms. The B's and C's resist filling out forms. That's very important for you to understand without ever, ever having to figure it out. They show you who they are. But if we deliver that package, it has a receipt form. So they'll come, our couriers take it, our runners take it, and they have on Rivers Team gear, and they walk into the office. I have a package for Bob Johnson. You can leave it right here. No man has to be signed for it. Bob Johnson, Bob Johnson, come to the front. Bob, you have a delivery package, Bob Johnson. So Bob comes up, 
picks the package up, signs for it, walks back with the package. What does co-worker say? What'd you get? What'd you get, Mr. Fancy Pants? Right? And Bob says, I got a package from the river stand. Now, I want you to really understand my intent here. It's very clear to me that the ideal scenario with every single buyer and every single seller is when we make first contact, within 30 minutes, I want all their co-workers to know who I am. Within 30 minutes. And I built a system where that absolutely happens. And it's built on service. So to the consumer, this feels like high response. Is this high customer service? You call me, we stopped everything and delivered a package to you immediately. So from their viewpoint, this is high service. And it is that from my viewpoint, but it's also, I want every coworker that they work with to know who I am within 30 minutes of that phone call. Now I'm gonna keep delivering to the office. The average seller will get eight to 10 deliveries and a lot of the deliveries are coffee cups. They have flowers or chocolates in them with a little note card. Thanks for the first cup they get is Monday morning, right? If we listed it on the weekend, Monday morning they get a packet or a cup at the office. Chocolates, flowers, a little note card. Thanks for the trust, the Rivers team. That's it, very simple. But the cup says ringtherivers.com for real estate. And we're going to send another one. If we do an open house, it'll be the first week, Monday morning, coffee mug. The house looked great, thanks for the work. We'll call by 9 a.m. with the feedback because our system says the listing manager will call by 9 a.m. with all the feedback to the sellers. Y'all follow that? We don't have to ask, we know it'll happen because it's a what? System, it will be done, it will be done. Now, they'll get about six to eight coffee mugs that say ringtherivers.com for real estate at the office in the course of a transaction. Where did they end up? Well, in the lunchroom. So all over Tallahassee, Florida, every single morning in businesses all over the place, everybody's staring at ringtherivers.com for real estate. And my brand is inside all their co-workers' heads. Y'all hear this. And because of all the flowers and all the pot packages and all of the chocolates are those people who know who I am now looking at me thinking, my realtor never did any of this. I never got squat. Is this true? So now am I looking different and special? Yeah. And you got to realize there's other layers to this that we add on, but our vision is I do not want to be looked at like any other realtor. And it's not that I'm ashamed of the other realtors, but I do not want to ever have to deal with commission activity. If you like everything you've heard about me and everything you've seen about me by the time we have the appointment, pay me my money. You don't want to pay me my money? I'm leaving. With no regrets, you're the one that's making a mistake, not me. I've got more appointments. Y'all follow that? I'm going to get more listings. I'm going to make my money. You're the one that's going to hire Cheap Joe, and Cheap Joe is going to just make you mad the whole transaction. Is that true? Yeah, yeah you're going to get Cheap Joe. <laughs> cheap Joe. Idiot Joe. All right. All right, so creativity. Where does creativity play in all this? If you're a single agent, this says you're unstable. But it's not a personal comment. This is about your business. It says your business is unstable because you don't have a model in force. What is a model? It's nothing but the accumulated systems necessary to deliver goods and services to consumers. That's it. It's just it's a combination of systems. So if you started up your database, your command CRM, and you put in a bunch of names, but you didn't put in email addresses for half of them you are actually not running a fully realized model. You're still being creative. Oh, I have a database, absolutely. It's only half functional, but I have a database, right? So that is not doing this. This is unstable when you do that. If you have models, what's the goal of a model? Very simply, the accumulated systems necessary to deliver goods and services. What's the goal of that? Uniform customer service. Uniform customer service. It's very simple, it's very pragmatic, but the goal is to always deliver exactly what you intend to deliver and nothing else. Nothing else. Always deliver what you intend to deliver. So what's the goal of creativity? Did that, when I talk about the coffee mugs and delivering a package, does that strike you as creativity? Yeah, yeah it is creativity. What's the goal of that? All that's correct, but the, the goal of that is take market share. Take market share. If I get 
two or three of those co-workers to end up using me, they're gonna, they're gonna go with me and they would have gone with another agent had I not shown up in their world, yes or no? So I literally took market share away from somebody. And sometimes I find out who it is and sometimes I don't, but I know that would have gone to somebody had I not gotten it. You take market share. You take market share by getting inside the heads of people who don't know who you are. That's taking market share. It's also called mind share, right? But you gotta get in people's heads that don't know who you are. Yes, okay. So, tactic four is about finding the motivated and that is two basic ways. Lead generation is these two things. It is prospecting or marketing. Which works best, prospecting or marketing? You're the only brave soul, say it loud. Prospecting. Prospecting, hands down it works better. And because it works, you get busy. And when you get busy, where's the time for prospecting? You don't have it. That's the curse of prospecting, it really works. So what do you need marketing for? When I'm busy, when I'm busy, when I'm busy, right? That's what you need it for. Prospecting takes very little, if any, money, and it takes high amounts of time. Marketing takes some or more money and very little time. Ultimately, you need both. Single agents and an agent with one admin should absolutely be prospecting based marketing enhanced that literally means you should talk to people and after you've talked to them and collected data about what buying selling or referring then you send them something that's called marketing so if somebody said well we're not sure about selling we might just stay here and remodel Wonderful. Could I send you the National Association of Remodelers guidebook to which rooms renovated make the best yield on investment when you sell the property? Would that be of help to you to make a decision about whether you're going to stay or you're going to buy a new home? Well, yeah, that would help me. Great. I'll email it to you. Follow you up in a couple of days and see if you have any questions. So we talk to people and then we send them something and then we follow up and talk to them again. And again, the talk can be like this. Did you get the guidebook? Do you have any questions? Should we meet? Would you like me to tour your home? Give you my opinion. Are y'all following all this? Okay. Marketing based is what large teams are. Most large teams, past clients and uh, 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 sphere will not give them the units. When you're trying to sell 400, 500, 600 units a year, you have to go after stranger business. Does that make sense? You have to. So when they're gonna go after stranger business, that will be a marketing approach. They could do it prospecting, but it'll be marketing. And what is the marketing the top agent teams are doing to get new leads, hundreds of units? What is it? Say that again. Internet, it's the internet. Internet, it's the web, it's the web. That's where everybody's going that wants to get a volume of leads to work through. It's the web. I mean, that's what built Zillow, isn't it? And if you're an agent that understands the business, and God bless you, if you're one of those few that understands the internet, you can use what you know about real estate to capture more business than Zillow can. And it'll all be built around hyper-local marketing. Zillow is marketing at a 10,000 foot level. But when you market to a neighborhood or a part of town specifically and use keywords or key attributes about that area specifically, you won't get tons of leads like Zillow does, but the leads you get are specifically tailored for what you're trying to work on. Does that make sense? That's very cost effective and it works really well. And Zillow cannot compete at the one foot level. They can't. It'll cost too much money for them and they're already broke, right? So, yeah. Uh, so ultimately what those agents are doing is they're, they're marketing to capture contact information and then they prospect them. How do they prospect them? Telemarketers, ISAs are on the telephone, in large teams, they're getting leads on the internet and people are calling to follow up. Telemarketers are calling to follow up, yes or no? Yes. Yep, that's, that's, the, that's the high level game and if you're thinking about expansion, that is how most all expansion has been built in KW, is with agents, having a core admin that signs up for a Boomtown or a Sink or a Tiger Lead account in another city, they start following the leads and their telemarketers start calling and then they start booking appointments for the agents in that city. And that's how it works. 
and those are marketing based prospecting enhanced approaches those are expensive right that that approach is expensive but if you so I said these are big teams that are doing it because they have the money to invest and grow in the business all right so the goal of all legion is one thing it's contact the goal of contact is the appointment I walk around my offices and I've had this on my team forever. We'll get a new agent on the team and they always talk too much on the phone. You know, it's a sign call. I'm calling about 1515 Smith Street. You got 30 seconds to a minute to get the appointment and get off the phone. And a lot of agents in my office, I'll see them. I'll just walk through the office and I'll see them doing a sign call thing. Yes, it's a four bedroom, three bath. It's $278,000. Uh, it's 2,100 square feet. Do you have any other questions? And I'll just walk. And I'm going to see the team leader, the MCA, some agent, or whatever. And I'll walk back 15 minutes later, and I swear to God, I see this all the time. All the time. And they're just doing this. Well, um, I think we could maybe push out that back wall if you added a, uh, another room on the back end. I think it would be just perfect for you. Oh, my God, would you just shut up? <laughs> I said, make the appointment. Make the appointment. Telemarketers that we just talked about, people who do this for large teams, they typically have two-minute conversations, and they either book the appointment or they park them to drip them to call back later to get the appointment. That's it. And a lot of telemarketers are not even licensed, so they can't answer questions. So, yeah, I'm calling about Smith Street, and this happens with us. I'm calling about 1515 Smith Street. Wonderful. Hold on a minute. And they're scanning. That, that is Jean Rivers you need to speak to. Uh, let me see if I can get a hold of Jean right now. And they're pushing one Thank button, you. and it's a robo-dialer, and they're calling my four numbers. And if I don't answer in four rings or less, they're going to bounce back. I'm sorry, Gene's not available, but I'm looking at his Google calendar, and he can call you back at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Would that be available for you? Um, yeah, that'd be fine. Great. Let me have your name again, full name. Thanks. Let me get your phone number. Uh, let me get your email address. I'm going to sync this to your Google. Do you use Google? We're going to sync this to your Google Calendar. So the appointment will pop up for a 2 o'clock call with Gene Rivers. Thank you very much. See you later. Bye. And the agent's going, beep, beep, beep. You have a phone appointment with a possible buyer. Right? And then when they get on the phone with the buyer, what are they going to say? I understand you have questions about 15 Smith Street. Are, are you a buyer, an active buyer, or are you a neighbor? That's the script right out of the gate because it could be a seller, right? Are you a buyer or are you a neighbor? No, I'm a buyer. So you go, how long have you been looking? Now, the agent is not answering questions. They're asking questions because what are they going to do? They're going to ask for the appointment. They know they're going to ask for that in about 15 seconds, and they're going to qualify the appointment. Are you working with any agents? Have you been to the bank? They're going to ask about four or five qualifying questions, and then they're going to say, okay, so I'm happy to show you 1515 Smith Street, but I'm going to ask you one question. Based on what you said to me, your process of driving around and calling off signs hasn't really helped you find a home to buy, has it? So why don't we meet at the office, and let me do a quick wants and needs analysis, and in about 15 minutes, we'll probably have one or two properties that you'll probably want to see as well as Smith Street, and maybe more than Smith Street. And you can stop wasting time and actually find the home you want to buy. Does that make sense, sir? Now, I do, I'm saying the scripts to you. It's less than a minute. Y'all y'all follow that? And we're going for the appointment, but we're going to qualify first and then go for the appointment. Well, could you just tell me more about the house? You know what? If you see the house, all the questions you haven't even thought of will get answered. So let's just go ahead and see 1515. I'll see you there in about uh, 20 minutes. Well, I just had a few questions. They'll all be answered at the appointment, sir. That's it. <laughs> Give me some ahas so far this morning. We're getting ready to go off the deep end now. Give me some ahas. Come on. Give me an aha. You know an aha. Yes, ma'am. I like that coffee cup thing. You like that coffee cup thing. Let me tell you what. The coffee cup thing will make you hundreds of thousands. I was calculating your average sales price. It might make you millions of dollars. Yeah. No, it is fabulous. We can literally look at spikes in our web traffic. We know when the mugs get delivered, we sit back and watch it, we get an activity bounce on websites. Wow. Yeah, because we deliver them, you know, yes. Well, that's in the schedule, we have to get the appointment. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. the appointment. Yes. <laughs> By the way, that's a powerful script. I'm glad you said that, yes. Uh, comes down to finding the motivated, as simple as that. Comes down to finding the motivated, as simple as that. Motivated to do what? 
Buy, sell, refer. Perfect, perfect. Buy, sell, refer. Yes, sir. The game is big data and AI. Boom. Mr. Keller would like you hearing you say that one. The game is big data and AI, and it really is a war. It is a war. I mean, now we have Amazon eyeing us. Amazon is going to try to figure out how to beat us in the eyeball game. What do we have that they don't have? Our big data. They have their big data, but as all of you put your databases onto command, our data, our total database data, when all that's in command, they don't have anything remotely like that. But what's the issue? When you put that name in, how much data do you actually put in? Data. Data. Hard data. And if, if you're worried about putting data about your people in command for security reasons or whatever, privacy issues, I totally get that. It boils down to one question. Do you believe in the integrity of Gary Keller and Mo Anderson or don't you? That's what it boils down to. And they have made an absolute stand that all of the data in command is going to be private data. They will not sell that data. Gary has shown the opposite character. He doesn't sell out to anybody. He'll go to war against NAR if he has to to protect you, your data, and your commission. Is that the behavior you're saying out of hand? Absolutely. 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 I mean, the guy could sell Keller Williams in a blink and take billions of dollars and just sell off into the sunset. Is that true? And yet he's there every day warring, warring with all of these competitors. It's just a brilliant thing to watch in the annals of business. There'll be books written about what's going on right now for decades to come and about what happened when all these titans started clashing. Realogy, Remax, Keller Williams, Amazon. I mean, we are clashing at a high level. And out of this is going to come a dominant player. And guess who my money's on? <laughs> yes, sir? I know you said that you won't be done over the millions. Millions. Before you take that first step into it, you set up the system for all that to happen. How do you investigate a remuneration the delivery guy, what you're paying for? Yeah. You take yeah, you take one step at a time, but you have more resources than I ever had, my wife and I ever had, and much cheaper. You can actually get Uber drivers to deliver your coffee cups for you. You don't have to have anything span fancy, you can do it one at a time. You can buy, you know, ten cups and deliver ten cups and see what happens. You don't have to spend a lot of money to try out something, a strategy. Is that true? No, we get a pallet. No, we get a pallet of coffee cups every thirty days. Yeah, a pallet. A pallet. Yeah, there are there are more more ways to buy coffee cups today. Coffee cups are not expensive. We get great coffee cups for actually less money than we paid ten years ago. There's just there's just there's more utility today due to technology than there's ever been. You may not think about it, but you know robotics is hitting the making of coffee cups. <coughs> so coffee cups are getting cheaper, and the quality is actually getting better. And you know it's cheap stuff. It's not expensive. Yeah, yeah. No, we'll produce. Yeah. No, I, no, I love that kind. His aha was simple, that simple reality about your goal is one appointment a week. And remember, early on, I don't care if it's a buyer or seller, just have one appointment. But remember, it's got to be a legitimate appointment in your conference room, in their conference room, or in their home. And what's what's powerful about that? <laughs> That's true. Face to face, yeah. He said they can't hang up on you. Yeah. Well, they can show you the door, I guess. Say that again. It's a commitment. That's exactly right, Peter. It's the commitment. When people will take an hour out of their future life and give it to you, that is a level of motivation that says what? And they don't not, they don't consciously think this, but what they're saying is, I would consider hiring you. I would consider that's, it is no guarantee at all, but they will not give if they already have the realtor they want to hire, they're not giving you an appointment. 
Right? They're just not, because they would think about that. Why would I do that? That's a waste of time. Right? But if they give you the appointment, there's an open door for you right there. So what's your deal? Walk through it with bells on, right? Make a splash when you enter. So that's what the deliver the package is about. Make a splash when you enter, right? They call to book the appointment. I'm going to enter with a splash, right? Okay. All right, let's move on here. Your business is your database. Have you heard that one? What do we got going on here now? Somebody is disconnected, bro. Sorry to see that. Okay, uh, your business is your database. And again, this is command. Look at this truth. This is really important. The size of your real estate business will be in direct proportion to the size and quality of your database. Which of those is most important, size or quality? Quality, perfect. If you're a single agent and you're new, your goal is not to build a huge database. Your goal is to build 150 people. They're all quality. 150. They're all quality. And what do I mean by quality? They're like they're likely in the next year or two to buy, sell, or refer you, or refer you, and more to refer than to buy or sell. Um, okay. Get to the table. These are the four laws of database. Uh, this page is significantly important. Build a database. What does build mean? Add what? Not add people. That's the problem that most agents actually mistake. They keep adding people. What you should be adding is more data on the people that are already in there. It is the lack of follow-up that makes most agents not get production out of their database. It's not about put them in, mail them, and never talk to them again. It is put them in, mail them, and follow up on what you're mailing them consistently over time. Consistently over time. Um, you should put the data in that relates to an old acronym. So when I learned, there's others, FORD, F-O-R-D. So it's put in their contact information, put in their family. How many kids? How old are the kids? Housing moves in the United States, the single biggest driver of housing moves is family status. Family status. Getting married drives a home sale or purchase. Getting divorced drives a home sale and two purchases. Try not to smile when you get that one. That's a good one. I'm so sorry to hear you're getting divorced. Now let's talk about the three transactions we're talking about right now. <laughs> Yep, kids. The census data says if people have two kids under the age of five or more, they will move at least twice between K and 12. Twice between K and 12. My wife and I have four kids. We have moved with the birth of every single child. One third of births, one third of births, this is census data, precipitates a move within one year of the birth. And the funny thing is it can be a year before or a year after the birth, but it'll be a, a move within one year of the birth. My, uh, my oldest daughter and her husband lived in Manhattan. He was a Wall Street lawyer. He was a lawyer for the Bank of New York, uh, had 20 lawyers underneath him in the securities department. My daughter got her PhD at Columbia University in art history and was hired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art while she was doing her final dissertation to go to work for the Met. So they're sitting there with two pretty high-flying careers in New York City. And this was two years ago. We were all together. We have a, a ski chalet in the mountains in Canada, and we were all at the ski chalet, and, and my daughter and her husband said, well, we've decided to have a family. And of course, my wife shrieked and nearly fell out of the chair. <laughs> Uh, I had one grandson at the time. My oldest son had, had a boy. And she said, we decided to start a family. And, and then she said, and we decided we want our children, and we love that word that you use, children, uh, to have the same growing up that we had. And we said, what are you getting at? She said, we want a, a nice home with a big backyard where their kids can run around and play, and we can have backyard parties and a little blow-up pool, and the little babies can play in the little water in the pool. And we can't do that in Manhattan. <laughs> so we're moving, moving out to New York City. And the problem, the problem is my, my daughter. We knew he could get a job anywhere. My problem is my daughter's degree and her experience is a very high level, and there are literally only a handful of museums in the world where she can really exercise her talent. So 
So we're like, I think your best job ops are all in big metropolitan cities. What, what are you going to do? No, it wasn't New Jersey. Um, she said, well, there is one museum in the United States, one that I would consider an appropriate place for me to work, and I'm going to send them a letter to see if I can get a job. And that museum, pull on your seats, is in Buffalo, New York. That's, that's, that's what mom, Re Re Rebecca, my wife, that's what we said. Excuse me, say that again. <laughs> it's called the Albright Knox Museum. This is a little small story, but it's very illustrative about the need to collect data. The Albright Knox Museum is named for two men, Mr. Albright and Mr. Knox, imagine that. And back uh, in the middle 1800s, Buffalo was a much bigger center of commerce than New York City was, Buffalo. And it was all of the timber and the grain and the produce coming from the Midwest through the Great Lakes and the rivers out into the ocean and going off to Europe. And Mr. Albright and Mr. Knox were two of the most wealthy people trading in all of the, the, the goods that were flowing through that area. So they were going to Europe regularly because that's where their clients were. They went all the time to Europe and they started buying up this street art over there. And the street art artists they were buying up were named Van Gogh, Cezanne, led to Picasso. They were buying all this art and they brought it back and they stockpiled it and they got so much their spouses rebelled and said, get this out of our house. And they started a museum. So today in the world, the museum that has the most Picassos in the world, no surprise, is the Picasso Museum in Spain, in Seville, Spain. But the second most owned Picassos is the Albright Knox Museum that has 94 Picassos. Their Picassos are put on display all over the world at the Louvre, and my daughter's already accompanied one Picasso to Paris, because the curator always goes with the artwork, you know, and make sure it's safe. So that's where they moved to. So they moved there, and last November, after being in their home for one year, my granddaughter Huxley was born. So they moved a year ahead of the birth. There are people that are delivered just like that, right? And then there are other people, it just is a year later because they didn't know they were going to be preggers, and it's a little off guard, and you know, going to save up a little down payment money. All right, so. Uh, put in the Ford, F-O-R-D. O is occupation. Where did they work? Where did they work before they work? Where do they work now? Because that creates trails, and trails can be farmed to. Uh, and then R, recreation. A lot of housing is related to recreation. Now, I'm in Florida, and that is hyper true in Florida. There are people that want to live on a golf course, people that want to live on the ocean because they have big boats. There are people that want to live on water because they like to fly fish on lakes. Recreation is a big part of housing decisions in Florida. I don't know how much it is here, but I'll bet it is some. So you need to know about people's recreation. If you find out what their recreation is and you ever list a house that matches their recreational uh, uh, attitude, send them that property. Send them that property. Put them on that drip. I'm not talking about an MLS drip. I'm talking about your drip. And then D, very, very neglected. D stands for dreams, F-O-R-D, family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. And what is the dream about? Agents don't do this, and they really need to do it. When you get a new client, and they're buying or selling, and they're staying locally, you need to ask them, tell me about your dream home. Like one day, what is the home the two of you would like to live in? Would you like to build a new home? Would you like to live in a high-rise condo with a view? Would you like to get a... A home with acreage outside the town? What's your dream home? Where do you want to get one day? You need to ask that question. And you can move people along that. You need to also ask them about, have you ever dreamed about investing in real estate? You need to ask them. You'll find that people that have assets, if you sell somebody a home for a half a million bucks, they have assets, yes or no? Yeah. I'll bet you anything, they have stocks, bonds, 401ks, they have stuff. And those people that have investment assets but not real estate have thought about real estate investing or they will think about real estate investing at some point. You need to be aware of that. Well, yeah, we thought about it, but we ruled it out. You need to note that and you need to come back and work that. Now, this is another biggie race uh, relative to my perception about what's going on. Vacation home, second home. I'm in the state of Florida, which is the state with the most second homes in the country. And I have offices on both shores, Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico. And we look at the amount of people, absentee owners, that come down and buy a second home. And we send out a single digit of referral fees on those properties. 
You know what that means? And no offense, but y'all are prime targets. We have a lot of people buying down there from New Jersey and New York, right? That means that their view of buying a vacation home in Florida is they have to meet an agent in Florida. That means that their agent has never consistently said to them, now listen, if you ever decide you want a second home, no matter where it is in the country, the Carolina mountains, the coast in Florida, wherever, I'll help you find the right person to help you. So just contact me and I'm your go-to person for that. And because agents aren't doing that, their perception is we gotta go to Florida to get help on buying a home in Florida. Y'all get that? You need to be talking to people about the second homes. I own a house in the mountains and a house at the beach and I never had any agents talk to me about that at all. Never, never, until we went and got the agents, never, it's crazy. So yeah, um, all right, so here's what it looks like, a graph about the uh, database. Uh, it's set up just like this, you do capture, Capture is about contact info, so at an open house, you need them to register, because if you can't follow up with them, you got nothing. So capture, uh, connect, connect, what's connect about? No, 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 I'm talking to you at the open house, what's connect about? Common ground, just, just realize it's about this. It's not to do with real estate, it's about them and you. What's one of the best ways to find a common thread quickly at an open house? Stop waiting for them to come up to the front door. When you hear somebody pull up, you need to immediately go straight outside. This time of the year, bring two cold bottles of water. Go up to the passenger drawer, open the door. Hi, my name is Gene Rivers. Thank you so much for coming to my open. It's hot. I brought y'all some cold water. And then scan the car. <laughs> if there's a child seat in the back seat, you, no, I'm serious. You go, this, this is not being oblique, you go right into it. Oh, I see the car seat, so you have a family, tell me about your family. And then they'll say, oh, well, we have two kids. Oh, how old are they? Uh, six and two. Oh, I have four kids too, aren't they great? I have a, I have a grandson who's six, so it's amazing, isn't it? Come on, let's, let's walk up to the house. Now, we're going to chat about the kids until we get to the house. And by the time we get to the door, we've connected. Now I could see a bumper sticker. I could see a tag. I could look on the floorboard and go, oh, y'all like Wendy's. I like Wendy's too. <laughs> I am not kidding. It's about talk about something, not real estate. That's how you connect. If you start talking about real estate, their mindset is now you're selling me. Is that true? Now we're in that sale mode. If I'm not talking about real estate and we're chuckling about Wendy's and what sandwich do you like better, we're not connecting. We're two people talking about something we each like. Is that true? Is it that simple? New agents, look in the room here. I'm gonna ask the experienced agents a question. If you've met somebody at an open house ever and like two or three weeks later you're writing a contract with them, raise your hand. New agents, do you see that? Look at how many hands are up. So is it that simple to connect with people? That's it, that's it, it's not complicated. Okay, and then uh, when you connect, what's the goal of connect? Move past it and get, get the appointment. Get the appointment. If you can't get the appointment, you have to do cultivate. And what's cultivate about? When you do it well, when you do it well, after you do that, you find out how close are they to buying, selling, or referring, and then the activity of when you're gonna ask again is tied to that data. Y'all follow that? And I'm gonna pump communications to you so that you see increased value of when I ask you for the appointment, you'll be willing to give it because of the value I've shown you over four or five communications. Does that make sense? I know it sounds complicated, but it's really a simple process. So. The way you cultivate is by three simple things. Mail, call, see. And they can go in any order. Any order. You call them, you mail them, you try to see them, or you saw them at the open, and now I mail you and then I call you to follow up on what I mailed you. It's mail, call, see, that rhythm. And right now you're getting ready to uh, mail your lunch into your mouth. So uh, do we need any special instructions about lunch?